Thank you. Um, I, I guess I would call you Madam Chair right now. Um, that being said, uh, thank you, Mr. Bradley. I, I, I've been watching this and, and listening quite intently. And obviously, on both sides of the argument, uh, we are evoking very strong emotions. And, and I would uh, encourage that um, as a, a part of a democratic process that we all respect each other's perspective and offering different viewpoints. And I, I really appreciate your passion. Uh, and, and if I may, um, your organization, Caring Families, have, has it ever been uh, accused of deceptive advertising practices? So when you say accused, accused by who? Oh, no, 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 no. A, 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 a complaint filed against your organization. Yes. Yeah, so, no, we have never had a complaint filed against our organization. The only accusations of any deceptive advertising of poor caring families has come directly from NARAL. And, and they have not filed any formal... Um, they have not. Okay. No. And, and for many of your peer organizations... Uh, from your experience, the best of your knowledge, have many of them had formal charges filed against them versus the the kind of social media hits and misses that occur on both sides of the argument? So to date, um, my understanding is there is no pregnancy center here in the state of Connecticut that has had any type of um, complaints filed against them for deceptive or misleading advertising. All that for that lack of a better word, rhetoric has come from uh, from the NARAL about that. Thank you. And, and, and if that is indeed the fact, I, I do find it uh, interesting that uh, we are raising a bill in, in such contentious and challenging times um, when there were really no formal complaints and basis, just innuendos both sides back and forth. And I find it also interesting that our, our attorney general would, would look to buy into this conversation as well. Um, and and uh, so that that's just my observation on that. Number two, and, and I think most importantly, as we go further into this conversation, is uh, your passion, your, 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 your mission of your organization, is it deeply faith-based? Um, it's, I would say it's equally faith-based as opposed to experience-based. Um, when, when I was, when I found myself, um, 20 years old with my girlfriend, uh, we were in a situation with an unexpected pregnancy and that was a really difficult time for us, you know, being uh, third year students at college, trying to navigate how we're going to finish and do all this. Um, this was actually at the university of Connecticut at the time. And I remember my girlfriend going and I went with her to the uh, medical center and the medical center there was only able to really provide us with information on having an abortion. And that's not something that we wanted to do. We wanted to find other ways for us to be parents, other ways for us to uh, get connected with help and resources. And so that for me is really where my passion is born out of because having experienced that, having know what it's like to be in that difficult situation. And, you know, we talk about choice, but it, it seemed like in, in that point at 20 years old, my, my girlfriend had no choices before her to be able to stay in school, stay on campus, be a mom and complete her, her classes. And so that's really where my passion comes from. You know, and it's, it's been 20, 23 years later and we're married and our oldest son is, is one of the, uh, the greatest choices we have, one of three boys. And uh, I'm just thankful for that. I'm thankful for, you know, that experience that I had and, and, and wanting to be able to help other people in the way that I wasn't able to be helped in that place. And that's, you know, that's, that's a big part of my passion here for caring families is I want to well, make sure those resources and support systems are there and they know that they're there and know that they're not going to have to go through this alone. You, you, you tell a very compelling story, uh, Mr. Bradley and, and, uh, congratulations on on many years afterwards and um and the family that you have uh uh credit and and uh, uh, uh must be given to you and and you also recognize that at that difficult time in your life challenging time you had to make some important decisions for yourself and your your loved ones um and and i hope as you advocate for your organization you also respect that each individual at that moment in time is afforded the opportunity to make their own choice. Would that be a fair statement in your belief it as is. well? It is, and that's, that's part of our core values of, of our organization. 
is that we respect the decision every single client makes. And so if, if we're providing support for parenting and adoption and that client chooses and makes the decision to have the abortion, then, you know, there's nothing that we're doing to stop them. We're not trying to talk them out of it. We've already had the conversation. We've already shared all the things we can share. And we just let them know that we're still here for them. They walk out that door. We let them know we're still here for them. The things that we talked about, you know, those, those um, pressures that you're feeling in your life, you know, those things that are kind of coming down on you, whether it's work or um, family or housing, whatever those problems you're going through, we're still here for you. We're still committed to working through that and supporting you through um, whatever you do next. So, yeah, we're very comfortable in that space. And and thank you for, for bringing that up. Well, I, I, I think this is the way I approached it. I, uh, I, I hear such passionate viewpoints uh, in, in the in the initial onset of this hearing. But I also heard your story and and your decision making process as emotional, challenging as it is. I think all parties can agree that for those people that go through that struggle, even right now, that they are afforded a choice to make their own decision. And I'm really glad to hear you say that if individuals choose to make a decision other ways, that it's their decision. And and so um, I, I, I appreciate that. And I'm glad that we can find similarities and, and agreement in that respect. That being said, I, I think it's important to ask why I asked the second phase as to is your organization and, and, and the approach beyond the personal experience, is it faith-based? Because I, I think one of the important sure. questions I have is, as we embarked on addressing this bill when it was first raised, I, I am extremely concerned that it seems to be targeting faith-based organizations, and it might cross the line, as uh, Representative Fiorello cited earlier, that there is some constitutional um, and, and Supreme Court uh, basis of, of separation of church and state. Uh, and so I ask you of that from your organization, is, is it strongly faith-based or is it personally based upon your experience and, and yeah, your so mission? It, it, it's both of those things. So that's where my passion comes from. So for me, my passion comes from that. Um, I, I am also a person of faith. And so that that faith compels me to show love and care and support for all of all of the people here in the world. So, yeah, and, and part of that is we, we do have a belief um, that uh, human life is valuable and, and all it's from the moment of conception to, to, the, to the point of death. And it needs to be cared and, and protected through that. And I recognize that everyone shares that our view. Again, we're not out there telling other people that they need to bend to what we're saying. We're asking for us to be able to exist in this space uh, with, without having things, uh, our speech controlled. And, well, you know, it's interesting. One of the testimonies, um, one of the written testimonies as I was reading through it was from um, an organization, I think it was Secular Connecticut. Um, and, and, you know, they're really big on the separation of church and state. And, and they made the point that this bill does not mention religion at all. However, the deduction of this, I think, is very important, is why do faith-based pregnancies and centers not provide abortion? And the answer is that it's because they're faith-based. And so, therefore, regulating pregnancy centers, you are regulating faith-based organizations. And, again, the SB 835 is very clear that it's about abortion because not only do they define it, but they use that as the term on whether or not this, um, or this um, law would be enforced against an organization is whether or not they would provide it or not. So I thank you very, very much. And, and uh, Madam Chair, and to the uh, uh, administrative clerk, I, I just wanted to make sure for a point of clarity in this Zoom world, if we could change uh, Mr. Bradley's name from Representative Lanou so that uh, people can identify and, and if they popped in right now, um, they would not get the clarity and, and presume that this is Mr. Uh, Representative Lanou. So if there's any way we can change his name on the screen uh, for future conversations, uh, uh, I think that would help in clarity. So thank you, Madam Chair, um, and I appreciate the opportunity to ask the questions.